I, knowledge of the sky is something that is commonly considered kind of a dual thing of being really ancient and naturalistic and yet also very much at the cutting edge of science. So today I'm going to focus on the ancient end of the spectrum, but um, maybe I'll stick around and hear your updates at the end so I can hear about the sort of modern cutting edge of modern science end of the spectrum. Um, but what I want to talk about today is sort of the way that cultures through time have not just uh, sort of recreated and manipulated the cosmos, but learned from them and utilized them. Um, and so we're going to look at a wide variety of things, but the vast majority of what I'm going to talk about is what is happening here in the United States. Um, I think it's really striking as an anthropologist, you'll see that I'm in the anthropology department. Um, as an anthropologist, we recognize that all human cultures choose at various points to represent the cosmos in all sorts of media. So they do it, we were just talking about a poem, they do it in words, in songs, in rituals, um, in architecture, with visual images, with mathematical formulas, etc. Um, and what I think is so cool about archaeology is it shows that this is something people have been doing for millennia. Um, of course, when most people think about archaeoastronomy, I think they think about the ideas that were um, placed on the ground at the site of Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England. Um, this is definitely where my introduction to archaeoastronomy was as an undergrad, but we're going to talk a little bit about Europe today and then quickly zip back over to the United States. Um, so just in case people aren't familiar, I'll do like the rapid fire summary of some of these big European sites. Stonehenge was constructed during what we call the Neolithic period, so that's between about 4,000 and uh, 5,000 years ago. And those standing stones that you can see in this picture are, of course, the, the most famous part of the monument, but it's also one of its, by far, one of its later stages. Um, the site famously aligns, if you've ever been there, you'll hear a lot about it aligning to the sunset of the winter solstice and then the opposing sunrise of the summer solstice. But I think one of the things that maybe fewer people know about Stonehenge is that it, um, based on excavations, archaeologists have been able to discover massive numbers of uh, really detailed lunar alignments. And most of those stones that, that aligned with the lunar um, calendar are small and have since been removed. And so you don't actually see those when you go to the site, though they do have them marked um, on the ground where they once were. Um, archaeologists have basically proposed that Stonehenge would have served as an incredibly elaborate astronomical calendar that would have allowed Neolithic people to even do things such as predict eclipses and other major events. So, you know, this, for what it is, is a really remarkable piece of ancient technology. Um, this sort of monument, Stonehenge is the most famous example, but they're found all over Europe and the vast majority of Neolithic monuments have these uh, very deterministic astronomical alignments. And so we think that that has to do with the fact that Neolith the Neolithic period was an, a time in history when knowledge of the sun and moon was particularly important. And we were chatting earlier, one of the reasons for that is this is kind of when you first see people starting to experiment with ideas of agriculture and plant consumption. And so it's probably no accident that that was when they really started to treat the solar and lunar calendars as something that needed to be sort of written down on the ground. Um, the massive amount of resources and labor that went into constructing these things and the precision with which they were oriented is really telling in terms of how important they probably were. Um, in terms of this precision, I think one of the most uh, clear cases of this is the site of Newgrange in County Meath, which is on the east coast of Ireland. Um, this site dates to about 3200 BC, so that means it predates Stonehenge by about a thousand years, so this is a, an exceptionally old site. Um, it's what we call a passage tomb. So it's called that because there's a passage from the outside of the tomb that you can walk into the inside and get into the burial chamber. Um, and then the surrounding thing is made out of stone and earth. Um, and this particular site, Newgrange, was constructed in such a way that at sunrise on the winter solstice, which is what you're seeing in that bottom picture, the sun shines directly down the passage and it actually illuminates that interior room. Um, seeing Newgrange on the winter solstice is like a life stream for me. It would be really amazing to be there. Um, and one of the reasons it would be so amazing is that it's basically impossible that this alignment could have happened by chance, um, especially when you consider that it's happening on such an important day and that the geometry required to make it happen um, is just exceptionally detailed and impressive. And this is especially true if you consider the fact that the site itself is basically built into a landscape of rolling hills. So where sunrise is, is going to depend on exactly where this site was sited with 
respect to all the other surrounding hills and mountains. Um, in this case, uh, they have to have a really detailed sense of the surrounding landscape, and then they also had to make some really special design considerations. Um, so just out of curiosity, can you see my cursor when I move it around? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing some nods. Great, cool. So that means I can point things out to you. Um, so one of the things about this that I think is really amazing is they, they constructed this little roof box, which is what's up here in this top picture. And it just has this tiny slit between the roof stones that sort of allow the light in. And what this does is it limits the light in such a way that it really only illuminates the tomb for this brief moment at the point of sunrise. Um, and you can see the path of the light coming in here in sort of a vertical down looking view, and then here in a horizontal view. And you can see that the geometry really needed to be exactly perfect to allow that light to get in. Um, so really, these images hopefully give you a sense of both the scale, sort of what, how small of a slit we're talking about here, and then also just how precise the architecture needed to be in order to get this inner chamber illuminated. Um, one of the most exciting things about Newgrange uh, is that in the 2018 drought in the British Isles, uh, we learned a great deal about the site because of what it did to the surrounding farm fields. Um, so a previously unknown monument was identified in the field just right next to Newgrange, and that's what you're seeing sort of right down here, this big circle. Um, this was only identifiable as a series of crop marks, which probably means that it was made out of wood. And so it's been entirely decomposed and now buried. Um, interestingly, this was discovered by two amateur archaeologists with drones. So they were sort of up and exploring the surrounding fields. They knew that these crop marks show up basically because the vegetation in the field is actually feeding off of the organic material from those rotting posts that were in there and it's making those plants grow just a little bit greener and a little bit better than the surrounding area. Um, we don't haven't excavated at this site, so we don't know a whole lot about it, but I think it's a really good reminder um, how much we don't know and what, what lies beneath the ground of sites like Newgrange. Um, we haven't really even worked out the astronomical alignments of this, but I know that some of the archaeoastronomers in Britain are spending time with this henge. Um, and they're, they're going in conclusion basically right now is that it was probably very similar to Stonehenge, but because it was originally made of wood, it just doesn't show up on the landscape in the same way. Um, so with that kind of rapid look at Neolithic Europe, I want to move away from Europe now and talk about my area of specialization, um, North America. I uh, grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, so right in the center of the country and was really taken immediately by how little we knew um, and how little we were taught in uh, our, say, history classes and social studies classes um, about Native North America prior to the point of contact. And so a lot of my work now is focused on sort of bringing uh, Native North Americans, particularly the pre-contact ones, back into conversations that often focus in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, so I think what I'll do for basically the first half of this is kind of give you a quick rundown of the chronology of ancient North America and give you some examples of archaeoastronomy sites that come from that chronology. And then at the end, I'm going to um, delve into one aspect of it in a little bit more detail. Um, so people first came to North America about 15,000 years ago. Um, they either came by walking across the Bering Strait, which at that point would have been a land bridge. Um, so basically during the period of glaciation, during the Ice Age, um, so much of the water would have been sucked up in the glaciers that the water levels would have been lower and the Bering, what is now the Bering Strait, would have just been a land bridge people could have walked across. Um, if you were taught about this in school at all, that's probably what you learned. We now know for a fact that people also came in via a sea route. They came in on boats down the coast. Um, this is a little bit of a newer hypothesis, but it's been really well proven at this point. And so now it's more of a debate about how many and which groups came in via these two routes, but there's really no longer a debate that both of these routes were likely utilized. Um, regardless of how they got here, I think the important thing is that they undoubtedly came over with an incredibly deep knowledge of the sky. Um, they probably used that knowledge to guide them on this journey. They certainly would have used it to know when certain seasons were going to change. Um, but we can tell from similarities between what's happening in Asia and what's happening in North America that they brought a lot of their belief systems about the sky and constellations and various other things with them. 
Um, so archaeologists refer to these groups, these sort of earliest people, as uh, Paleo-Indian cultures. We obviously are just assigning these names. We don't know what they would have referred to themselves as. Um, but they lived in highly mobile bands. So they were moving around the landscape with the seasons. They were hunting and gathering for their food. Um, they were using stone tools for various tasks, but they had no pottery or metal. And they probably relied really heavily on the sky for navigation, as well as, of course, for light. And I think this picture that's an artist interpretation of Paleo-Indian cultures does a good job of reminding you sort of how much time they would have spent at night with only firelight, only campfire light, um, which would have just been a very different view than we have today. So uh, around 8,000 BC, and you can see I sort of put a little chronology across the bottom here so you guys can keep track. Um, but around 8,000 BC, we see pretty dramatic shifts in the archaeological record that lead us to differentiate the people that live before and after that year. Um, the people who live from about 8,000 to 700 BC are what archaeologists call archaic cultures. And it's during this time, specifically kind of right in the middle of it, around 3500 BC, that we see people in North America start this practice that basically forever changed the landscape of the Eastern United States. Um, and that is that they started constructing earthen mounds um, from the surrounding landscape and, and leaving them sort of permanently there. And this slide here is an artist's interpretation of one of the earliest archaic mound sites that we know about. It's located in what is now northeastern Louisiana, just a little bit um, north and a little bit west of where I do my excavations. It's a site called Watson Break. Um, and like many of these early sites, it actually still remains pretty mysterious to archaeologists. Again, these are people who have no pottery and no metal. So what they leave behind is pretty sparse in terms of an archaeological record, which sometimes makes it hard for us to understand what their life ways were. Um, but what we suspect is happening is that these are still these highly mobile bands that are moving around the landscape regularly, but population levels are becoming just high enough that they want to start to claim their territory in some sense. And so they build these mountain sites basically as central gathering places where these otherwise dispersed and mobile populations can come together for special purposes. And I imagine that these special purposes would have been things like reestablishing bonds with your family members and your kin, finding marriage partners, um, probably mourning the dead, celebrating weddings, you know, anything like that would have been a, potentially an excuse to come back to this mound site and celebrate with your wider community. Um, so we're going to speed through the early part because we know a lot less about what these groups thought and knew about the stars and then we're going to focus on these last two periods a little bit more. Um, so just around 700 BC, we see the development of pottery and a variety of other major cultural shifts um, such as the domestication of certain native plants, um, development of what seems to be more elaborate ritual structures. And so with that, we move into what archaeologists refer to as the woodland period. Um, so it's during this period, during the woodland period, that the practice of creating these huge monumental mound sites really takes off. And we see it spread out of Louisiana and Mississippi, where it begins and all throughout the Eastern United States. Um, this is likely related to the fact that pottery developed at the time, which means that they were using ceramic vessels. They were, um, which, you know, would be much, uh, much more fragile, say, than a basket. They were also planting gardens of particularly productive food plants. And so for that reason, people were sort of urged to settle down and stay in one place on the landscape more. And thus, that gave them the chance to sort of build larger, more impressive mound sites. And one of the most elaborate manifestations of this is a culture that we refer to as the Hopewell culture, which is focused in Ohio. Um, and that's, I've got an example of a Hopewell site up right now. Um, the Hopewell culture thrived from about 200 BC to AD 500, so over the year zero. And it was during this time that Native American cultures built these really massive earthworks in elaborate geometric shapes. So the one I have up right now is the site of Newark in Ohio. Um, it includes the largest Hopewell enclosure in North America. And it's made up of, just to give you a sense of scale, um, this causeway that connects fr from here to here is two and a half miles long. So we're talking about a really massive um, construction here. And then it also includes these geometrically perfect earthen embankments. So these big circles, 
there's some squares, and then uh, Newark is particularly famous for its octagon. Um, and I think it's important when you're looking at these sites to remember that uh, that this this sort of geometry was being done with no ability to see it from above. You know, so they weren't able to fly an airplane up there and be like, yeah, that looks right. Um, they really had to be able to do the geometry right there on the ground. Um, so I want you to pay attention to this little circle that's right up here, um, just for a sense of scale. So this is this little circle, and then this is that circle today on um, a modern golf course. So the site of Newark is um, actually preserved really well because of its location on a modern golf course. Um, the golf course is private, though they're currently, uh, there's currently a lawsuit to say that because this is a National Register of Historic Places site, it should be open to the public. Right now it's open only one day, but you do, they do have some viewing platforms. So if you're ever driving through this part of Ohio, it's well worth a visit. It's really incredible. Um, we know that the causeways that emanated from Newark um, connected from, connected this site to a variety of other sites. And you can sort of see this in this old map that's on the far side. Um, many of these smaller sites that you see on this map have been destroyed by things like plowing, urban expansion, road construction. But we know they existed because they were documented historically. And this, this map is a great example. This map was made in 1847. And it shows just how many of these earthen enclosures were in this sort of tiny little area surrounding Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, so it's, it's really something to go to that area. A number of them are preserved and visitable, um, but so many have been destroyed. So for the purposes of today, one of the important things about Hopewell Earthworks is that these sites tend to have um, significant astronomical alignments, again, focusing primarily on solar and lunar events. Um, Newark, one of the things that I think is a great fact about it that I always like to rub into my students, um, is that if you actually do the math, the Newark earthworks are twice as precise as the complex at Stonehenge. So while we think about Stonehenge as sort of the setting the, the, the standard for ancient calendars, um, in fact, a lot of these Eastern North American sites are, are much more accurate. Um, some of the archaeoastronomers that work at this site have demonstrated that the octagon itself basically comprised a lunar observatory um, that was designed to track the motions of the moon, uh, specifically focusing on marking the northernmost point in the 18, I guess it's 18.6, you guys probably know this better than me, cycle of the lunar orbit. Um, and I think this is one is particularly amazing to me as a non-astronomer to think that they recognized all sorts of things that happened in the sky that I would never notice if my life depended on it. And so it really shows the degree to which they were regularly interacting with and using these specific days. Um, at this point, on, on that po the northernmost point of the lunar orbit, um, the moon currently rises within about one half of one degree of the octagon's exact center when it's observed from the little observatory mound that's right there. Um, so it shows it's really quite accurate. And then you can see on this diagram that many, many, many other alignments relating to the range of moonrise and moonset locations have been recognized. And I think this is one site where we're quite sure with all those causeways and the other circles that there are probably a lot of alignments that have not even been dreamed up by today's archaeoastronomers, um, potentially just because we haven't thought of it, or possibly because they're not astronomical events that we necessarily assign particular importance to today. So, for example, the setting and rising of certain stars or constellations may have been something that was really important to this culture, but that we no longer deem those stars particularly important. Um, I think that's one of the fun mysteries about archaeoastronomy is that we can really only hypothesize about this and we could always be very wrong, um, but it gives us some really interesting stuff to play with. Um, so moving towards the next uh, period, so mounds become really, really common throughout North American prehistory. And at the same time that mounds are becoming more common, we're also seeing more and more artifacts that are showing really elaborate decorative motifs. And it's clear that, that at, at a certain point, kind of just at the end of this Hopewell period, that objects or the decorations added to them are meant to depict specific things rather than just sort of geometric pretty designs. So in this case, we've got um, a bird sort of uh, carved into the side of this pot, or we've got this hand which is cut out of a thin sheet of mica. Um, and this is a really important thing for archaeologists because it gives us some insight into what people were actually thinking and seeing as important because they start drawing it for us. 
Um, so we refer to the study of this in archaeology as iconography. So the definition we use, because I know that a lot of um, different disciplines use this in a different in different ways, is that iconography is basically the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images as distinct from their artistic style. So just as an example, it doesn't matter whether I make these three religious icons that I have up here like simple or really fancy or black and white or I make them look 3D or 2D. They mean something to pretty much every single person in the world today that's entirely independent of how they're drawn. And so as archaeologists, we think of these sorts of complex sets of symbols as something that we can actually start to see when we see these elaborately decorated objects start appearing in the archaeological record, particularly as the symbols are repeated over and over and over again. Um, a single symbol can come to sort of tell a whole story or bits and pieces of a story. So a great example would be if I were to show the cross and particularly if I were to show it in a, a particular motif, um, it could be said not only to represent Christianity but also to maybe evoke very specific details of the story of the crucifixion. So you know, quickly you can go from one symbol to really understanding the stories. And what I want to talk about for sort of the second half of this is how we as archaeologists have understood the stars and people's beliefs about the stars better by combining our study of archaeoastronomy with our study of iconography. Um, so coming back to our chronology of ancient North America, the next big transition that we see is around AD 1000. Um, and at this point, we enter what archaeologists refer to as the Mississippian period. Um, and we see a lot of important changes that take place here. And one of the biggest ones is that we see a shift towards the construction of these really large flat topped platform mounds. So the mounds start to look really different than they did before. We also see an intense reliance on corn agriculture for the first time. So prior to this, native people were eating native plants. Um, at this point, we see the importing of corn from Mexico where it was domesticated and it becomes um, almost a monocrop style culture where they're relying really heavily on it. We also see the development of chiefly socio-political organizations. So we see certain individuals becoming much more powerful than other individuals and occupying sort of official political positions. Um, and then lastly, we see the development of large permanent cities for the first time. So the one that's up on the slide right now is the site of Cahokia, which is a major Mississippian site in Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. This is where I got my start as an archaeologist. I went here um, on field trips all the time as a kid um, and I'm now running a project really nearby. So it's kind of fun to have come full circle. Um, so just by way of background, the city of Cahokia is really quite exceptional and something that I wish we learned about in schools. If you combine it with its outlying settlements, basically its suburbs, it was probably home to as many as 50,000 people. Um, it would have taken a day to walk across or probably even more than a day to walk across on foot. Um, I think one of the ways that I hit this home when I teach about this is that Cahokia would have held the record for the most densely populated city in what is now the, like, and it, it's now what is in now the United States. And it would have held this until the early 1800s when the burgeoning city of New York finally surpassed it. So in terms of its density, it was as dense as any other place in our entire country until the early 1800s when New York finally became bigger. Um, another good way to say it is that this was basically occupied during the medieval period. We don't tend to use that word in North America, but this is approximately the same size as mes medieval London. So when you think about medieval London, most people don't question that it's a city. Um, however, we are really taught that there weren't any major native North American cities prior to European contact, and I think Cahokia is, is the foil for that. Um, so Cahokia itself, the site itself, contained about 120 mounds and then lots and lots of other archaeological features. Um, and these have been the focus of massive amounts of research. The mounds are enormous. The biggest one, which is the one you can see in the center of the slide right here, is 100 feet tall. Um, you could fit about 16 football fields underneath it to give you a sense of scale. Um, so this is a really, really giant place and it's attracted a lot of attention. Um, just like at those Hopewell sites we were just talking about, um, the huge number of mounds at Cahokia were not just arbitrarily placed on the landscape. They were placed very carefully to reference various aspects of the natural and cultural world. Um, and some recent researchers have examined how this careful placement of mounds related to 
other aspects of the Cochian landscape. Um, in particular, the image on the bottom down here is an image of a huge Woodhenge. Um, Woodhenge is basically a giant solar calendar that represents exactly the same type of monument at, that we saw at Stonehenge. And in reality, probably actually looks almost exactly like that new henge that we recently identified at Newgrange. So Woodhenge at, at Pahokee is probably the best analog we have right now for that new henge at Newgrange. Um, so during the site's primary occupation, when it was this bustling medieval city, Cahokia's Woodhenge was rebuilt four different times using absolutely massive cedar posts. So the posts themselves um, would be multiple feet across. So again, this is taking massive amounts of labor. And really detailed studies of the archaeological remains of these posts, both little bits of the posts themselves that have per preserved, um, but mostly the, the pits that they were set in has allowed us to reconstruct it so that visitors can actually interact with it today. Um, so Cahokia is a World Heritage Site. It's open to the public. And you can go and stand in Woodhenge on these important astronomical events and sort of witness what people would have seen at the site. Um, so if you were to do that, if you were to go and stand at Woodhenge's center post, so this post right here, um, you would be able to see a variety of things that are marked by the perimeter posts. Um, so you can watch the sun rise and set at specific posts, and it's unquestionable that those posts would have probably marked important plate moments in sort of the year. We know that some of them mark the solstices and the equinoxes, but we also imagine that the other posts probably mark points like when you should start to plant your harvest, um, when you might want to till your fields, when it might be important to start irrigating your fields, all sorts of things that we may not understand um, quite as clearly today. But the one we've been able to determine was perhaps the most important is that on the fall equinox, the sun rises directly to the east over Monk's Mound, which is the big mound that I was talking about before. Um, this is that 100 foot tall earthen pyramid that formed the very center of like the ritual precinct of Cahokia. It's also where we believe the chief would have lived. Um, and visitors who have been there today, me included, um, I'm, I, these aren't my words, but I have been there for it. But a lot of visitors describe it as if Monk's Mound itself looks like it was giving birth to the sun. So you can sort of see that the mound has two levels and the sun will basically emerge sort of right from within that, um, which is really, really something to see. It's, it's almost perfectly aligned. Um, but we do know that in addition to these really important dates, it probably helped determine all sorts of ceremonial events that we don't yet understand. Um, but based on the materials that we have found at the site and particularly at the location surrounding Woodhenge, we know that there were people who traveled up to 500 miles to attend the ceremonies at Cahokia. And it's likely that these special occasions would have surrounded important astronomical events. So this city that was already hosting up to 50,000 people might have had multiple thousands more coming in for these important astronomical events and taking advantage of the calendars that they created there. Um, one of the biggest questions in American archaeology surrounds the origins of Cahokia and particularly why at about 1000 AD massive numbers of people came together at one site basically for the first time in the history of the continent. Um, and this slide is one of those things that I'm going to talk to you guys about because I think it's really interesting, but I think it's important to say that this hasn't been proven and it likely never will be because we just can't go back and get inside people's heads. Um, but one really interesting hypothesis that has been put forward by archaeologists who study the rise of Cahokia is that people were inspired to create this whole new ritual system, this idea of major cities, um, by the sighting of Halley's Comet in the year 989. So the year 989 coincides almost perfectly with the beginning of Cahokia. Um, and you can imagine that for a community of people who had exceptionally intimate knowledge of the sky, the sudden appearance of something that was not normally there and that would be you know, incredibly rare and incredibly meaningful and maybe a bit scary, you know, something that you might feel like you need to pull together in order to protect yourself from. Um, so again, you all probably know this better than me, but for other audiences, I often put up this picture on the top to show people just how prominent something might like this type of comet might have looked. So this is a photo of Halley's Comet over the Penshaw Monument in England in 1986. And so, you know, we're talking about a very different time, much more light pollution, and yet it's still that, that bright in the sky. If that suddenly appeared on the Cahokia landscape, I think it would have really um, caught people's attention. 
So we have no direct evidence of this from Cahokia, um, but interestingly, we do have some potential evidence for it from another North, Native North American site that also rose to incredible prominence in its region right around 1000 AD. Um, this time, this is happening in the American Southwest. Um, so this piece of rock art that's depicted here on the bottom is from the site of Chaco Canyon, another publicly accessible site that if you've never been to is just one of the most amazing places they've ever been. It's in New Mexico. Um, and this image, which is thought to represent a comet down here, And so it kind of fits the narrative that people have been constructing around um, the beginning of Cahokia, though we don't necessarily know that that's the case, and, and we probably never will. Um, I think it's fun to think about, though. Um, so while comets in particular have not been identified in the iconography of the Mississippian period, um, many scholars agree that there are um, all sorts of Native understandings about the cosmos generally and about the stars specifically that we really can understand. And a lot of what we know about this comes from three sites that I figure I will show you on this map really quick. So Cahokia is up here. That's the one that we were just talking about. Um, but we also know a lot from the sites of Moundville in Alabama, um, Spyro in Oklahoma, which is this site over here, and then Etowah in Georgia, which is here. Um, the iconographic materials that we have collected from these sites have earned themselves the name of the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex, and archaeologists have used these materials to basically piece together the stories and beliefs upon which Mississippian religion may have been built. Um, this, of course, is not an easy thing to do because no single piece of iconography tells the whole story. And so instead, basically what's happening is we're piecing it together by looking at all of the known instances of a particular motif. Um, so with respect to Mississippian religion, this is actually being done through a series of academic conferences that take place at Texas State University, where basically every archaeologist who studies Mississippi, Mississippian iconography gets together um, they look at an image or the actual artifact, depending on whether it can be brought, of every single artifact that shows a particular motif, and then they try and piece them together and make stories out of them. And they've made incredible progress. Um, and so for the last few minutes of this, I want to tell you a little bit about these, and I will, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. I'll tell you that it'll probably seem like I'm making some pretty big leaps in my interpretation, um, but I would have to give you like a seven hour lecture if I was gonna go into all the details. So you'll bear with me for now and then I'm, I'm happy to go into more detail later. Um, so this image here is an artistic representation of the Mississippian cosmos as was drawn by the archeologist who runs that Texas State Conference. Um, he's really focused his entire career on mapping out all of the various characters, places, items that are regularly depicted in Mississippian art. Um, this diagram itself is made up of actual Mississippian images that were kind of taken off an object. So any given thing, like say this guy up here or this hand over here, is taken from an object, but it's him that put them together into this diagram. Um, so what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is basically break this diagram apart for you and tell you a little bit about one of the stories that it depicts. Um, and then you guys can ask me all sorts of questions about it. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you what part of the diagram I'm talking about by kind of highlighting it in a color and then showing you some of the examples of the artifacts that depict that particular part of the worldview. Um, so the overall illustration relies on the basic idea that the cosmos consists of three layers, the above world, the beneath world, and then this world or the middle world where we live. Um, so here are those layered cosmos. Um, the, this world, what they sort of, we, we usually refer to as this world, um, is our world. It's the world of humans and most animals. Um, and images of human beings occur really regularly in uh, Mississippian art, as do many images of animals. Uh, the world is often depicted as floating, um, and the above world is seen as sort of the celestial vaults or the sky, and the beneath world as being underwater. Um, and these above and beneath worlds are inhabited by various animals, so things like birds, fish, and serpents, um, but also by supernatural beings. And I wanna show you a couple examples of these. 
So in the above world, the focus uh, within the iconography is on the sun god, who often took a kind of human uh, bird hybrid form. And so you can see someone here with wings, um, but human looking legs and arms, and then a beak, um, but otherwise human like features. Um, we believe that chiefs drew their power from suggesting that they have strong connections to this individual. And we know this because in chiefly burials, we often find people buried with regalia like, um, like bird wings, and we see masks that have bird-like features buried with these individuals. Um, in the beneath world, we've got a very different type of creature, one of my favorites. Um, the beneath world ruler was the underwater panther. He was often viewed as a cat or a cat snake hybrid, and he was seen as a really powerful and dangerous creature. And native groups um, kind of around the eastern United States today uh, still believe in this type of creature. Um, and the underwater panther is something that's depicted even in contemporary native art. Um, so these three worlds are believed to be connected by something called an axis mundi or a world axis. And this is commonly represented in the Mississippian world as either a tree or a striped pole. And you can see both of those things here, a tree, but then the striped pole being in the above world and the beneath world. Um, importantly, what this was believed to do is allow for communication between the worlds so that supernatural beings could travel between them and could talk to each other without necessarily coming into our world. Um, regardless of what story is being told, which world you're in, anything like that, um, the center of the world is incredibly important to Mississippian people, and it's always symbolized similarly. So in this world, it's symbolized by a simple cross. In the above world up here, it's symbolized by a cross with lobes surrounding it. And then in the beneath world, it's symbolized by basically a swirl cross or a swastika design. Um, this tells us as archaeologists that the presence of any one of these objects on an object or any one of these images on an object um, can tell us where this story is taking place. So if you've got a lobed um, cross, it's taking place in the above world. If you've got a swastika design, it's taking place in the beneath world. And this becomes important with a story that I'm going to tell you in just a second. Um, another thing that's really important in all four worlds are the four corners, which would have been the four cardinal directions. In the above world, there were thought to be thunderbirds that sit at each corner. In this world, there were thought to be snake-like creatures whose tails extended down into the beneath world and basically held our floating world that we live on in place and made sure that we didn't float away. Um, and then finally, the folks that have dedicated their careers to deciphering Mississippian iconography have identified a few specific myths or stories that are repeatedly depicted. And I think this is the place where this study is going to go next. I think we're going to learn more and more of these stories. Um, but I want to spend the rest of my time, just the last few minutes tonight, focusing on one of these stories. Um, this is the story of the Path of Souls, which is clearly depicted on the diagram that we've been using. Um, but I'm going to show you some other diagrams, too. Um, the archaeologist involved with the Texas State Conference noted basically specifically that at the site of Moundville, which is one of those major Mississippian sites I showed you, the one located in Alabama, they found certain motifs repeated over and over and over again together. So they were showing up on the same pot or the same carving. And those consisted of the hand and eye, which is this one up here, um, various iterations of skulls, which is what we're seeing over here, um, we also saw long bones, which you're not seeing great examples of at this point on the diagram, um, but you can see a long bone depicted over here really clearly. Um, raptors, so birds of prey, and then the winged serpent itself, this kind of creature that lives in the above world right here. And they basically noticed that while these motifs weren't showing up independently very often, when they showed up, they always showed up together. And so perhaps they were part of the same story. And once they started looking, um, they found these objects, these uh, motifs occurring on objects and in archaeological contexts at many other sites as well. So not just at Moundville. Um, the argument that they have developed to explain this common co-occurrence is basically that this cluster of motifs represent Southeastern Native American beliefs about what happens when a human being dies. Um, and I think interestingly, this is something that almost all human cultures, um, regardless of where they are or when they existed, seem to be innately interested in. You know, we're interested in what happens to us when we surpass this moment um, of death. And so the archaeologist interpretation of Mississippian iconography in this case is uh, really well supported by what we see ethnographically. So what we see when we talk to contemporary Native groups, um, there's definitely some variation, but the, the level of correspondence is really impressive. 
Um, and the level of variation you see, I think I should point out, is exactly what you would expect considering the huge time span involved. You know, stories are going to evolve through time. Um, but the, the, the fact that sort of drives it all and that holds uh, the stories from the past and the stories from the present together is the fact that the soul travels the path of the Milky Way after the human being dies. This is basically a unifying characteristic of many, many native belief systems. And we believe that it's a very ancient belief system that was held by Mississippian people as well. So in all of these myths, the path leads towards the west in the direction of the setting sun. And it can only be reached by jumping through a specific portal, which appears in the sky in the shape of a hand with a special opening in its palm. So that's what you're seeing here is the path of souls is highlighted in purple. This is the portal right here. And I'm going to tell you, a show you some other things that kind of help get you through this. Um, so the hand itself is thought to be represented by the constellation of Orion. So for example, Orion is described um, explicitly as a hand by a number of contemporary native groups, including the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Crow, the Lakota. I think I'm probably forgetting some, but it's really common that Orion is just depicted as a hand. Um, as you guys know, it's just adjacent to the Milky Way and it sets in the West. Um, so the portal onto the path of souls is viewed um, and described by contemporary native people as a galactic fuzzy star that's represented iconographically as an eye and a hand. And I think this is a place where we see some really interesting overlap between the sort of understandings from the ancient past and the understandings of what we see today. Um, when I learned that there was actually a fuzzy star, a nebula in the Orion, um, constellation, I was like, okay, this is convincing. You know, this is something that people would have been able to see much more clearly than we are able to see it today. Um, one of the other really compelling facts is that they believe that the hand um, constellation, this portal, was only open on certain days of the year. Um, depending on which tribe you ask, uh, it varies a bit. And I think this has to do with latitude, but it's generally from sometime in late November until sometime in late April. And they say that it's because this is when the hand reaches down and touches the earth, but is still visible. So at some point during the night, it's gonna get down there, it's gonna touch everything, but then it's still gonna be um, visible throughout the night. So this, according to, to these native people today, puts the soul on the Milky Way and it's how the, and that sort of determines the path that it takes um, from there. And at that point, we see pretty dramatic differences in exactly how different tribes describe this path, but there are a few things that uh, are consistent and hold together well. So I'll tell you about those. Um, so no matter what, people always say that the human soul passes through a variety of challenges and past a variety of creatures along the path, and that these creatures and these challenges challenge the soul's passage into the afterlife. So this is basically like, you know, walking up to the gates and saying, like, was I a good enough person to make it into heaven? This is basically what's happening here, um, is that people are being challenged along the way. They have to prove their worth. Um, one of the places that most consistently is described um, as one of the locations where the soul is challenged is where the Milky Way forks. And it's at this fork that the soul is tested by a supernatural being, usually some sort of raptor-like creature. Um, and this makes a lot of sense with where we see the common constellation of Cygnus or the Northern Cross. Um, and when you look at a variety of native cultures and even cultures around the world today, um, this is often viewed as a bird, which I think makes sense when you see it. And so this ties really well with the archeological um, distinction. I put this object up here just because I think it's really cool. This is a great example of something where we long recognize the sort of center symbol down here. So this is the lobed center symbol. We know that this means this story is taking place in the above world. We see the hand and eye. And so we've always seen this object and said, great, we've got a depiction of the portal showing us the portals in the above world. Um, and then once we placed this particular moment at the fork in the Milky Way, we were able to come back to this object and notice that interestingly, the arm here takes this really elaborate fork. And so what you really could read this as is that you've got some a portal here. And then before you actually make it to the above world, you have to, you have to go through this fork. Um, and so this is a great example of an object that actually made more sense to us after it was reanalyzed with these new ideas. 
Um, then the one other thing that all of these stories share is that at the end of its journey along the Milky Way, near the other horizon, the soul reaches the winged serpent, um, the end of the path that symbolizes that it has successfully made it into the afterlife. Um, and this happens at our current constellation of Scorpio. Um, and again, this is something where, uh, you know, it's a winged serpent in native religion, um, scorpion to us. If you think that these are largely groups that had never seen a scorpion, it makes sense they would never have come up with that. But the idea of a snake with wings is very fitting when you actually look at the layout of the stars in Scorpio. Um, and so what we know is that when the soul makes it to the end, um, they come off the path and they basically become available again to counsel the living. They can go down, um, they can visit their relatives, they can travel that axis mundi and have communication again. Um, and that's sort of seen as like the ultimate success, the, the sign that you lived a good life and made it into the afterlife. Um, so I think I'll stop here and uh, I'm gonna, if I can figure out how to do it, I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, and then I'm happy to uh, take questions from you all. Um, actually, I don't have the option to unmute. I can ask you all to unmute. So I think I just did that. And maybe you can unmute yourself. Um, but I'm happy to go back to any slides to answer any questions. I would love to hear your thoughts on some of these hypotheses, because we're, we're definitely coming at this from, from very different directions. Um, I'll stop sharing for now so I can see faces, but I'm happy to put it back up at any point if, uh, if you want to see a slide again. That is awesome. <laughs> um, wow, there, there's a lot to unpack in here. Can, so, I don't know. I know I have a bunch of questions. Uh, I should let other people talk too, but um, I, could you go back to the slide that had the map of the different cultures? Um, just because it had some of the spellings of the names of these places. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm trying to start a list of these places just to sort of look them up on my own. Okay. And I'm happy, I should say, I, in the chat earlier, I sent my email address. Um, I'm happy if anyone wants a copy of the PowerPoint that they can interact with, I'm happy to send that. And also I'm happy, you know, if you want spellings, feel free to shoot me an email um, and I can pass stuff on. Um, but yeah, the sites that I was talking about the most are Cahokia here, um, Etowa, uh, Moundville, and Spyro. And then those earlier sites, the ones that are in Ohio, um, Hopewell, that word up here is the other one that I was using. I have a question that's kind of not quite related to what you're talking about here, but about 15 or so years ago, we went out to Mesa Verde mm -hmm. and we were looking at some of the cliff dwellings and up above where the houses were, there, were, there was a, a place in the cliff that had built in stone walls with ports that looked out in different directions. And at that point, they said, we've speculated, but we don't know for sure, but it seems to line up with certain events in the calendar. And I was wondering if you had done any studying on that or looked at that at all? Um, so I haven't personally done anything, but I would say that that is the general consensus um, that I know of as well, is that it's, again, very difficult to prove, but that those spaces are small enough that we don't really know what else they would be used for, and they are oriented in what you would consider to be unusual if it was just for ease of access um, directions. So Mesa Verde is only maybe two hours or so from Chaco Canyon, the site that um, had the rock art of the comet. So we are aware from Chaco Canyon was actually mm -hmm. later. later. Um, but um, but we do have the, the knowledge that there were a lot of people that knew a lot about the, the cosmos in that area at that time even before Mesa Verde, but certainly at the point of Mesa Verde. So it's not at all surprising. Um, I think the challenge with a site like Mesa Verde as opposed to a site like Stonehenge or a site like Chaco Canyon is that as you probably noticed when you were there, um, some things are in great shape, but those stone walls don't last forever. And so determining what has changed um, in which holes were pointed which directions and exactly what directions people face. You have to base it more on the actual construction within the cliff, the things that were sort of carved out and less so on the constructed walls. Um, but I would say the consensus is that, that there's certainly some evidence that people at Mesa Verde would use some of those high up spaces as sort of observatory points as well. Thank you. 
Megan, can you tell us a bit about your work in Plaquemine? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, looking at this map again, I actually work, um, let's see, I can point to it. The site that I'm current, I'm excavating two sites right now. One is right up here near Cahokia. Um, the one I've been doing for longer that I know much better is way down here in the very, very south um, west corner of Mississippi. Um, and it's a site called Smith Creek. It's not publicly accessible. It's on private land. Um, and it basically dates um, just to the few hundred year period right before the, the shift to Mississippi. And so the rise of Cahokia, the rise of Etowah, Moundville, et cetera. And my research is particularly focused on understanding that complex set of transitions that I briefly mentioned. So at this time period, we see people starting to construct platform mounds. We see them um, shifting to corn agriculture. We see them shifting to a more hierarchical social organization. And we see them starting to settle down in large cities. and. Our, you know, we were talking at the beginning of this about time and sort of how we view time scales. So as archaeologists, we know that there's no chance all four of those major transitions just happened like that, you know, and it was like, all of a sudden there were chiefs and big platform mounds and major cities and corn. Um, but of course, these things had to happen piecemeal. And so my research focuses on trying to understand the order that those transitions developed in and um, how they were related to one another. So for example, was the ability to build a large platform mound um, only, was that only possible after you could um, have one particular individual who was in charge and telling everyone else what to do? Um, did that person maybe get their power because they were able to control the surplus that a cornfield provides? Um, or was it the opposite? You know, Did people start building these big platform mounds and then chiefly social organization developed because somebody was like, I could live on top of that thing. You know, so I'm trying to basically place those things in time um, and understand how those different developments occurred. And what I can tell you so far from the years that I've spent there is that we know the platform mounds happened first now. There's just no question. We have dug a number of large platform mound sites that have no evidence of corn agriculture, no evidence of permanent habitation, and no evidence of chiefly burials. So I'm very confident in saying the mounds came first. Um, I've now kind of moved on from that to try and to tease apart the corn, the corn um, um, chief combination. Um, and I have currently am leaning towards uh, corn came first, chiefs came after. But I wouldn't say that my evidence is quite as strong for that yet. I need to find a little bit, I need to dig a, a few more sites that have really good preservation of the botanical remains where we can really see when corn first appears. Um, but right now we're seeing corn appear at my site a couple hundred years before we see structures on top of the mounds. And I think the structure on top of the mound is a pretty good proxy for when a chief is there. Um, and so I need to do a little bit of work to connect those things, but I think likely the order that we're seeing is like, uh, is mounds, then corn, then chiefs, and then the next step in the research will be like, how do we place cities in that? Um, so it's all, you know, it's a career project and there's a number of us that are working on it. It will go on for a while. Um, and that's why I have a project in both Illinois and Mississippi is it's sort of looking at those transitions cross-culturally, knowing that those groups um, probably navigated this transition in slightly different ways. Thank you. That's great. I have another question for you. Sure. Um, what time period uh, was the rise of the Incan and Mayan empires uh, in comparison to these periods here? And was, was there any influence um, in the southwestern part of the United States from um, I can't remember which one was in that area, whether it was Dinka or Maya. Maya. Yeah, so the Maya, Maya were in Mexico. Um, and so, uh, you know, Maya, like Mississippian, is kind of the end point of a long development. And so there's an archaic period of Mayan civilization, too, that starts early. Um, but when you're talking about sort of classic Maya, um, you see sort of the earliest Maya cities develop about 750 BC. So that's at the beginning of our, um, our woodland period. And then I'd say about 500 BC, you see the first monumental architecture. So I always like to point out to everyone that um, those early mounds that we have in uh, Louisiana predate any monumental architecture anywhere else in the Americas. So it's earlier. They're earlier than the Olmec pyramids. They're earlier than Stonehenge, honestly. So it's some of the earliest monumental architecture in 
um, the world, which again is always so shocking to me that people, um, that we don't teach about that in our schools because we've got so much important um, archaeology right here, but we learn a lot more about the Maya and the Inca. Um, the Inca are a little bit later, so the empire of the Incas is kind of right before contact. Um, it began in the 1400s and then ended in the 1500s. So um, the Inca are particularly late. Uh, by that point, you know, you're kind of right around when, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, a little bit before it. Um, but the Inca are who, who the Spanish contacted when they made it to South America. Um, in terms of contact between these things, so I'm glad you phrased the question in the way you did, which is, is there contact in the Southwest? Um, there's definitely no evidence of contact in the East. Um, we've got no evidence that there were uh, any contacts with Mesoamerica for these mound building civilizations that I study. Um, but the Southwest is a little bit more complicated. So we know that there was contact eventually, but we have a hard time placing exactly when. And um, we, one of the things that we, rely on as archaeologists for identifying contact is the movement of goods and you know the presence of goods from one place in another place but what that doesn't tell us is whether people were actually moving between those places or whether um, objects were moving along trade routes so undoubtedly um, what I can tell you for sure is undoubtedly the people that lived in the American Southwest did not respect the Mexico US border and they were certainly in contact with groups in northern Mexico and those groups in far northern Mexico were probably in contact with people a bit further south in Mexico etc 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 and eventually would have had contact with the Maya but it's unlikely that there were Maya individuals or American Southwest individuals actually going back and forth between the Yucatan Peninsula and the Southwest. So we refer to that as down the line trade. So you give something to someone, they give it to somebody else, they give it to somebody else, and eventually it gets to this new place. And we know that not objects weren't the only thing that moved that direction, but probably also ideas. Um, and so there were probably some shared religious beliefs, et cetera, that also traveled along these trade routes. Um, but it wasn't as if there was like, say, a group of Mayan people that came up and built the sites in the Southwest. Um, it would have been a much more complex and probably sort of multi-layered relationship between those civilizations. How about enslavement? Uh, sorry, say that again? How about the possibility of enslavement where <coughs> people would have been taken from one area to another? Yeah, so when, when we, when, if we were to see, you know, enslavement actually between say the Maya region and the, um, and the US Southwest, I think we would expect to see much more of the materials that we are seeing in really small quantities. And we would expect them to be more everyday materials, sort of the boring stuff. And what we actually see is the transfer of really, really high status goods. So things like macaw feathers and chocolate and stuff that would have really been probably tra traded at the highest levels. Um, that said, we know that there was a great deal of enslavement in both the pre-contact and post-contact kind of all across the United States. Um, so Native nations prior to European contact were most definitely engaging in slavery uh, between groups and within groups. They were trading slaves among tribes. Um, this was happening at the point of contact, which is one way we know about it, but we can also see it archaeologically in terms of the movement of, you know, say, we'll see that only the potters move from one place to another place and you start seeing pottery at a site that looks very much like pottery from another site. Um, so we know that that was happening, but not, not necessarily between groups that weren't neighboring. I think for the most part that's happening among, between neighboring groups and is usually a form of sort of purposeful violence to, um, you know, to, to take down your enemies. Megan, as, as Ilan said, uh, there's an awful lot to unpack in your presentation here, and I can certainly see where you need 17 hours to get a full representation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but just a couple observations. One, you're slided from, I believe it was Newark, Ohio. Uh-huh. Um, there, there was, uh, uh, is, is that the town that it's in? in yes, Newark? it is. I'll go back to that one really quick. And, and the other one yeah. was, was Chilocothi. Ohio yeah, so Chillicothe is near, like, so Chillicothe is going to have a bunch of, I just minimized you, so I can't see you guys now, but, um, so this site over here, these are from Newark, which is in the town of Newark, and located a ways away from, 
Um, Chillicothe, so Chillicothe is the area where we think all of those causeways that emanate from Newark were pointing towards. So there's a massive number of these sites in the Chillicothe area, which is why I chose this map. Um, but Newark is actually quite a ways away, which is incredible. So this is in the Scioto Valley in Southern Ohio. Um, Newark is actually really close to the highway. So if you're ever, you know, driving over to say St. Louis or Chicago, it's an easy site to visit. And it's right there in the city of Newark. Okay, and, and the other um, slide you showed was, I believe was different moon. Uh, I just wanted to give my opposite, this one, yes. Uh, it struck me that lined up so well with all the moon, southern and northern moon rises and moon sets. Uh, is it possible that they were moon worshipers? Yeah, I think it definitely is. Um, one of the things which I didn't get into here um, is the difference. What One of the arguments that's being made by archaeoastronomers today is that uh, the Hopewell culture, so this woodland period culture that we're looking at right now, seem to have been more focused on the moon. And then the... Um, the later Cahokian culture seemed to have been much more focused on the sun. And so while they were probably both aware of both, you know, it's not like they only focused on one, but I think it's much more likely that we see a lot of lunar um, importance in Hopewell time and then solar importance in Cahokian time. And there's a few potential explanations for that. One of them is the agriculture question, which would be the most helpful to you agriculturally. Um, another one is the navigation question. Um, Hopewell people were trading really, really widely. Um, during Hopewell time, you see goods coming from as far as like obsidian from the Rocky Mountains, um, yeah. marine shell from the Gulf Coast. So we know people were moving around a lot and perhaps there's a lot of navigation that's being marked here. Um, but other than that, you know, we don't we don't know for sure, but I think your observation is, is an accurate one and one that most archaeologists would agree with, that, that this culture seems to be more lunar focused while Cahokia seems to be more solar focused. The other uh, hypothesis I had when you were talking about the uh, uh, rise of the chiefs and the, the connection with corn and uh, you know, which came first and which came later, um, since as, of, as somebody who actually grows corn, that's what I do. I, okay. grow, I grow crops and I'm in agriculture. Uh, it's it just a thought that possibly uh, the chief or the or a person that would have the understanding of when the seasons are right to plant those things, that person could uh, elevate themselves to uh, <coughs> power because their crops are better than everyone else's because they knew when to plant them and they knew when to harvest them. I think that's a great point, and I and I think it it really does feed into exactly that question of like it's a you know it's a chicken and an egg question. Yes. In order for somebody to know <laughs> how to dig corn, they have to or how to build, uh, you know grow corn appropriately. They have to know it, and it takes a little while to know a plant, especially an imported plant from an entirely different <laughs> environment. Um, and so, does that mean that the corn had to have been there for a while before someone really understood it well enough to maybe make a true leap towards truly understanding its planting cycle better than anything else. We also know, and you can probably, um, you can probably confirm this as someone involved in agriculture, that you know, the corn that we're talking about then is very, very different than the corn we're talking about now. And it we know genetically that the plant changed a lot to, to survive in the Eastern woodlands. You know, it came from a tropical climate. Um, it came into the subtropics of the Southeast and then eventually just into the temperate um, Eastern United States and you know now we're growing it everywhere and so it also might have taken some time for the plant itself to have evolved enough to become more productive in these environments um, and there's some really interesting archaeology it's not the kind that I do but some really interesting um, ancient DNA archaeology that's being done right now to try and understand what actually happened to that plant on its sort of journey um, from Mexico to the rest of the world. Um, and I think that it's likely we'll understand exactly that transition that you're talking about a little bit more. Like, was it the person that changed? Was it their knowledge about the planting season? Was it the plant the cell itself? Was it some combination of those things? Um, and we don't know yet, but I think it's it's such a fascinating question. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's completely understood what you're saying. And, and personally, I think um, what they did was I, every year they chose seeds for next year. Mm -hmm. And they chose the, the seeds from the best plants, the ones who that throw that thrived, and the ones who maybe survived the drought better than other plants did. And they selectively hybridized the plant 
uh, managed <laughs> by doing so. Yeah, so we know that the people, these people would have been at least in the abstract familiar with that process because while corn was domesticated in Mexico originally, um, they did actively domesticate a number of native plants. Um, <coughs> it's actually that if you were to go out into your backyards tonight, I guarantee you could find some of them were incredibly important food plants before and were, we know from the archeological record went through the process of domestication. So um, one of the best examples is this plant called Kinopodium, which is basically the North American version of quinoa. So it looks just like quinoa, but it's a little bit smaller. Um, and we know they domesticated that plant. Uh, we see all sorts of changes to the plant. We see larger seeds, more easily shadowing seed coats, all the things that you expect with plant domestication. So that's a process that took place in the Eastern United States over and over and over again. And it, I think for that reason, your argument is a very good one that they, they would have known how to actively manipulate these plants into becoming more in line with what they wanted or needed. Yeah. Just one final point is, as you mentioned about the comet image at Chaco sure. Canyon in New Mexico. I, I was at the desert Southwest. I didn't get into New Mexico, but I did see, um, uh, in the Painted Desert and in southern Utah, many uh, carvings in the stone of that comet. Oh, really? Okay. As well, and as well as what I thought was remarkably accurate, um, what appeared to be a drawing of the solar system with the sun in the center and the circles of Mars, Venus, Earth, uh, Jupiter, uh, seven planets, which wow. were visible to the naked eye, remarkably accurate in this, in, not in the oval or, orbit, but in a circular orbit. And I saw that at several occasions in the Painted Desert, as well as other places in, in Utah, which is, is a phenomenal state to visit uh, just for those kind of things. But I, I have seen that comet image in, in other sites at the desert, in the desert southwest. That's really interesting. I'll have to look into those examples. Um, rock art is notoriously difficult to date um, because there's nothing there, you know, there's no carbon left behind usually that we can get a radiocarbon date on. Often sure. it's at uh, locations far away from where people live, so they're not leaving any trash behind that we can use. Um, but it would be really interesting if any of those sites you're talking about in the Painted Desert could be dated to that same time period of right around just before 1000 AD. Okay. Um, so I'll have to look into those and see if any of them have any datable material that could help build the case for that. And as also, we also have to realize that there was a supernova in 1060. Yeah. Uh, so or, Which may coincide with some of those those carvings as well. Yeah, so I didn't get into this, but um, that when people first published the comet idea, um, there were a lot of people who counter published with the supernova idea. So it was sort of like, okay, well, we're talking about a little too early for what we generally say Cahokia is, and then we're talking about a little too late for when we generally say Cahokia is. Um, the Chaco Canyon example, the one that uh, is up right now, that one aligns really, really, really well with Halley's Comet, which makes sense because it's sure. a very obviously comet. Um, Cahokia is a little harder. We really think it starts right about 1,000. So, you know, 1,060 is a little late. Um, the 989 is a little bit early. But I, but you are, you're totally on the same track as other people, and I think that's, that's very much an active conversation still. And kind of regardless of whether it was maybe the initial impulse, um, two major events that close together. You can imagine, you know, if, if Halley's Comet sort of threw people off and they were like, we don't know what's going on with the sky. And then, you know, less than a generation later, there's a supernova. People are going to be like, I think we should stay in this place. You know, I don't know that we want to, we want to shake things up too much. So I, I think you're totally right to bring that up. And people are definitely thinking about it. Um, if, if not for the actual origins of Cahokia, at least to sort of understand maybe it's rise to prominence. But their, their drawings are incredibly accurate. So they are drawing a comet. They aren't drawing a supernova. A supernova did shine in the daytime. Yeah. And so in it, it, up here at, at Chaco, they're definitely drawing a comet. But sadly, we don't have any comet illustrations nor supernova illustrations from Cahokia. So there's okay. a little bit more leeway there in the sense that we don't have the iconography to help us. Well, this, this, your, this conversation just opens up so many doors. Just great. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. And it's been, you know, the first time I gave a talk about archaeoastronomy, it was to the physics department at Penn. 
Um, and their grad students were like, this is so cool. And then, you know, I ended up doing one at Ritten with the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. So this is like my new favorite thing because I, I it's a fun <laughs> overlap for me. Um, and I always learn a lot from it because we're coming at the same topics, but from such different areas. So I hope that sometime when we're out of COVID, I can actually come out to the facility and, and sort of see the stars with you all instead of just you, talk about yeah, them. You really, you really need to see the Orion Nebula and you need to see some of these things under dark skies. Yeah. So I did one time, um, I gave a talk at the Woodlands in West Philadelphia, if any of you have ever been there, um, with the Philadelphia's, I, it was an amateur astronomical society, I don't remember which one, oh, and they brought out telescopes and I got to see the Orion Nebula and I was so happy. <laughs> um, it was really cool. But, I, but even that, you know, we were in West Philly, so it wasn't, it wasn't truly dark in any way, shape or form, but they had some nice telescopes, so it was doable. In that area, there's Bucksmont and Delaware Valley uh, Amateur Astronomical Society. So okay. there's a few folks out there. But yeah, this is mind blowing. Forget Stonehenge. This is. Yeah, like, I know, right? Let yeah. go of Stonehenge. Who cares about Europe anymore? <laughs> um, what was I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about how they viewed the stars. Did they have con constellations? Did they see pictures in the stars that meant something to their culture? Like yeah, we, we, think they, we think they definitely did. And we think that's what's being depicted in some of that iconography is that they really did see pictures and they just saw them so differently or not, honestly, sometimes not that differently. Um, mm -hmm. So like these ones, let me scroll us forward again. I think are our clearest examples um, of what they saw. So this would be sort of their understanding of what the constellation of Orion would have looked like this hand, except what it's missing is that it would have this eye shape here in the center um, that would have been the portal itself. But we see that depicted over and over again. Um, we think definitely that sort of, I, I'm using obviously a, a picture that shows sort of our names for the stars here, but we believe that they would have seen this raptor-like creature that's usually depicted with wide open wings. Um, and so it would have viewed the, what we call the Northern Cross as, um, as a bird for sure. And we, we see that bird depicted over and over and over again. Um, and then I think this one is my favorite. This is the most compelling to me. Um, their depiction of the winged serpent always has these three wings that come off of it. Um, and it's always got this sort of like curve to its neck. This is probably actually one of the le least curved ones. Um, but you can see it on these pots like right here and right here. The fact that it's always got those three um, and that the distance from those three to its head is like the right ratio um, for Scorpio, I think is, is one of the really, really compelling ones. And so when I see this winged serpent, um, that's actually like when I look at the sky now when I'm outside and I can see Scorpio, um, I, I choose to picture this one because I think it's, I also <laughs> am like, I, I don't have any experience with scorpions. And so I think this is just like a really, really great depiction. Um, so these are three that we know well. We, we, I would certainly assume that they had similar images that are associated with all sorts of other constellations and we either haven't identified them yet um, or there are constellations that we no longer deem to be the most important ones. You know, so when I look up at the sky, I'm horrible at identifying constellations. And so I will often think something is a constellation and then I'll like pull out the app on my phone and look at it and be like, oh no, that was nothing. That doesn't even have a name. Um, and I, I would imagine that they were doing that too. And so there's certain pieces of that information that I just don't think we'll ever be able to uncover. Um, you know, some of the things that are drawn on their uh, pots, like say this guy with his arms spread out, you know, maybe they saw that in the constellation somewhere and we just haven't yet identified what particular grouping of stars that's associated with. Well, Megan, that uh, Northern Cross, the, the bird image in the uh -huh. sky, under, under dark sky, the, the, the bird image is twice or three times the size of that Northern Cross. Oh, really? Okay. The wings, the wings of the bird extend out well past Vega to the right okay. by, uh, by two or three times that distance. It actually has both ends of the wings have a, a bend to them, a curve to them at the end. With, and the stars depict that very clearly under a dark sky. Oh, interesting. The Northern Cross is really only the body of the bird. There's okay. a tremendous amount of wing area that spreads out from that that is easily understandable as being a wing shape. 
I will make sure to look at that next time because um, that would be really interesting to see. I haven't seen it under uh, like a portal one sky, but there are a ton of nebula in that area. That's interesting yes, as there well. Are. And, and of course, the old the old joke about Cygnus is that that constellation is mentioned in the marriage in the marriage vows. Did you know that? Um, I I didn't know that until someone told me very recently when I gave this talk. So I didn't okay. know it until very very recently. Okay, good. So you know that. All right. But you must look at that under a dark sky and understand the, the size and the scale of it. Um, I will definitely look at that. I also think that that's a really interesting, I, I can't think off the top of my head of any iconographic objects we have that show, um, say like the fork or the portal in some scalar way with, with the bird, with the raptor. Um, but I'll have to think about that because I wonder if, you know, on, on an object that has multiple images, like whether we could get a sense of scale, you know, if the raptor is always being depicted as, as really, really large. Um, that would actually be interesting. And it, like I said, I can't think of something off the top of my head, but I'll have to, I'll ask the Texas State people about that. What really intrigues me is, um, I actually had wanted to be a New World archeologist when I was, I started college with that goal in mind and then ended up being an elementary teacher. But uh, I did a lot of reading of um, recorded Native American, you know, I guess it must have been oral tradition or something mm -hmm. um, many years ago, actually. And I saw this recurring theme of um, people saying that they were feeling troubled after the death of a loved one because they could not find the path. Yeah. And it's like, that was happening like all over North America, not just in one section of North America. Yeah, and absolutely. That, so that's really neat to hear that explanation. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's a great example of how these things come together when people really start talking about the broader trends. Um, you know, when I showed you really early on, I showed you that that map of the Americas and sort of the ability, you know, how people got over here. Oops. Um, and one of the things that I think is really compelling, and this story would be included in this, is the idea that some of these stories, um, maybe the idea that the soul travels the Milky Way, um, or potentially, you know, the idea that Though the, no, these are really, really, really ancient belief systems that might have come across the Bering Strait with these people, you know, and so one of the ways that we as archaeologists look to figure that out is we look at the Asian sub equivalent civilizations, the places where they were coming from, to say, okay, do we see the same sort of belief systems? And the sort of tripartite world with the Axis Mundi is something that we absolutely see across Eurasia as well. That seems to be an exceptionally ancient belief system. Um, the Milky Way thing, I haven't been able to specifically trace to Asia, but it's so widespread in the Americas that I think it has to be pretty ancient. Um, there are other examples as well. There's uh, the idea of a set of twins. So the idea of a hero twins is something we see all throughout Mesoamerica and North America. So that might be another example of a really ancient story. But I think when you see these really, really, really widespread stories, what I see as an archaeologist is that means that they're really, really, really old. Um, that they sort of came across with these groups originally. And then, of course, as the groups have changed, they've morphed a little bit this way, a little bit that way. The names of the characters have changed, you know, probably exactly how they're depicted has shifted, but those base level belief systems are just so fundamental to, to the peopling of the Americas, I think. So it doesn't surprise me that you were seeing that in a wide range of sources and from a wide range of time periods, because I think it, it's an incredibly old story that was passed down. So you had mentioned you were getting ready to travel. Uh, are you going to a site to excavate? Is, is that on the agenda for you? No, I'm not. Um, okay. Sadly, we can't <laughs> use any research funding. This Penn, because Penn doesn't want us traveling, we can't use our grant money this summer. So um, I'm not going to be doing any excavation this summer. The excavation was entirely canceled. Um, I'm actually just going camping in New Hampshire. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> truly vacation. Um, well, that's fun. That's yeah, good. just to get away and get out of the city for a little while. Um, 
but I will excavate again next summer and potentially, um, you know, if things clear up, uh, we sometimes like to do kind of late fall seasons, uh, particularly for mapping because the trees are better, you can see more easily without all the leaves. Um, so, you know, we're gonna reevaluate in September whether we can maybe plan a short season um, kind of between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, because that's, Penn has decided to end classes at Thanksgiving to, uh, you know, eliminate the chance that students will like go home for Thanksgiving, come back and bring germs with them. Um, so that gives me a little bit of leeway in terms of my teaching to potentially run a, a late fall, early winter season. Let us know where to sign a petition so that you can get the funding to go go do this excavation. Uh, I, I will definitely do that. I mean, what's sad is that right now I have funding. I'm just not allowed to spend it. Um, so it makes right. it even more frustrating because you know the money is just sitting there in the bank waiting for you. But um, I, yeah, it was sad to not go this summer, though I'll, I have to admit that there's, a, you know, it's relaxing. I normally take about 12 undergrads in the field with me, so I spend my summer not just being an archaeologist, but being a mom to 12, 18 to 22 year olds, and I won't say I entirely miss that part of it. It's kind of <laughs> nice to live my own life for the summer. Well, I'm glad you have the, the chance to enjoy uh, the current conditions as they are. Yeah, you got to get something out. You got to see the bright side. Yep. When you get up to New Hampshire, I'm sure in New Hampshire, there's a lot of dark sky areas. Yeah. Exactly. If, if you have a planisphere, do you know what a planisphere is? Kind of. <laughs> it's just like a piece of plastic that. and you set it to the date and the time. Okay. Yep. I've seen those before. I know what those are. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you sit in the dark for hours without a telescope and just look at the sky, you kind of get... I know for myself, I get a feeling of, of these ancient people who lived without a flashlight. Mm -hmm. They lived with fire as their only light. There was no light pollution. And, and you know, especially in the wintertime, there were many hours, waking hours in the dark. So they had no television or radio or anything. So they just stared at the sky for hours. And... Mm -hmm. It is just so fascinating to do with just the planet sphere and, and you get a, a feeling and you, you know, if you're in a real dark site, like he said about Cygnus, you see it in a way that you don't see it, you know, here in Southeastern Pennsylvania. First time my wife and I went up to Cherry Springs, we had been doing astronomy locally for several months. I had trouble finding the constellations up there because there were so many stars that, you know, it, it was it, a little confusing at first. Yeah. Um, well, Cherry Springs has been on my list, actually, of places that I, it seems like it would be well worth going for a while. So maybe I'll make it there. I mean, most of my traveling right now is traveling to camps because it's just easier in the world that we live in right now. So I'll have to look into whether I can get there. <laughs> We're going to Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Um, so it's, you know, it's pretty far out there, but I don't, I don't know too much about um, what we'll be able to see from the campsite. Well, there's a lot of dark, I and mean, if you just get out of the campsite and go, if you look online, there's uh, a map of, of the sky, it's in, in false color. And it shows you which areas are darker and which areas are lighter. Okay, I'll look at that. It might be a layer on Google Maps or on it, Google lightpollutionmap.info. That's the most comprehensive one I've found. Lightpollutionmap.info. Um, okay. And then Writing in that the top down. right, yeah, lightpollutionmap.info. In the top right, there's a drop down that has the uh, past few years all cataloged separately. Um, oh, interesting. So you can see the data, yeah. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So That's, beers. I mean, you, you tap into the heart of an archaeologist when you let us scroll back through time. I do it on like Google Earth all the time. <laughs> Just like look at those aerial photographs. So if I know I can do it with light pollution too, I'll be I'll lose a couple hours to well, that. I'm sure. This yeah. is with a, a couple um, satellites that have been launched um, and some some more specific data just in the past couple of years. So it doesn't go back too far. Sorry. Um, it only goes back, I think, to like 2011, something okay. like that. Still really interesting, though. Absolutely. So sort of going back to the gap in technology between, uh, there's an app for that, uh, like the Planisphere apps, um, and actually holding a Planisphere in the field, which is something I do, but uh, I don't have the opportunity to do too often. I'm usually in light polluted areas. But um, 
I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that are going on um, in the space world because uh, we're coming up after nine o'clock and we, we can spend all the time that I would want, but I also want to make sure before people start dropping off, they have like the dates that we're doing things. Um, of course, I want to babble about all the rockets being launched and Rocket Lab lost a uh, payload. Um, OneWeb is this constellation of satellites that is up for grabs, I think. The UK is about to acquire them, maybe. Um, there's a whole bunch of NASA contracts that are being thrown around for the Artemis program. Um, some fun things there. I don't really dig into all the different NASA contracts that uh, are going into the Artemis program, but just to sort of make you aware that these contracts are being sold out now. Um, Let's see, what else is going on? There's a bunch of small business grants available through NASA. Um, so those awards are, I don't know if they're available, but those would be through uh, NASA's research and technology program. Um, SpaceX launched stuff, uh, China launched stuff. Um, Barb, we have a bunch of dates of things coming up. Yes, I just put it out in the email the other day, but this, this coming Saturday, we have a, it's a solar, I'm giving a solar talk and then we'll have some solar observing. Uh, if it's still a go, uh, when I talked to Lisa at Spring Township the other day, they only had one family registered so far. So we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll talk to her tomorrow and see how registration is going. Um, and then uh, we have our Club Star Watch on the Friday the 17th. And... Uh, it's a rain date the following weekend. Uh, July 23rd, we have a uh, Night Sky Network webinar, webinar on Solar Orbiter. I just got the link up for that Zoom meeting, so I'll get that out in an email. And then I'm doing a science camp for some kids in the end of July. And speaking of the end of July, uh, the Perseverance rover, the next robot to go to Mars launched from the US. Um, We'll see if that launches. The rover's good to go. The Atlas V rocket, I think, has a test coming up tomorrow. So we'll see what the Atlas team is up to. Uh, but I really hope we don't miss this Mars window, because then it's another two years and 50 days until we get to launch to Mars again. Uh, who was it that already launched? Did, was it China or India that had launched to Mars? Um, someone sent a small uh, orbiter. Anyway, more on that later. Um, but Mars is up and coming in our orbit. So as we swing by, uh, hopefully we get some good stuff out there in good time in one piece. Um, other things going on. Well, let, let's jump back to this. Uh, were there any other questions about archaeo uh, archaeoastronomy? I know um, I'm going to be chopping through, I guess, Wikipedia or whatever other resources I can on some of these ancient observatories. I would love to get to some of the equinoxes, like the fall equinox at the, um, oh, which one was it? I mean, you, yeah. It Chaco? Yeah. It, you, it, at Cahokia is one of the easiest ones because it's a public, totally publicly accessible site. Um, I can send out, there's a couple of good resources. Uh, while, you, while we're continuing to chat, I'll see if I can find them and put them in the chat. Um, but there are a couple of pretty great books about archaeoastronomy that are, you know, meant to be accessible astronomically to the archaeologists and vice versa that, you know, you guys could probably have some good fun with. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be emailing you for the names of things just because I'll be going through this and uh, trying to figure out, oh, like what was this one site where you were talking about this? And like, I'm, I'm gonna tear through this and totally have a list of questions again. Well, um, feel free. I would be more than happy to answer. And that goes for any of you. Would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, awesome. Um, at the beginning of this, uh, if you scroll up in the chat, Meg shared, uh, the email address and stuff like that, but if you have any questions and uh, don't know where to send it, I'll help pass that along. And vice versa with any other materials where we can sort of dig into this because archaeoastronomy is a term that I've never heard before, before uh, recently. Uh, 
So I was fortunate enough to see this present, to see most of this presentation in Rittenhouse uh, at the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society in January or February. And something like that, yeah. Yeah, th this is awesome because we're able to go through and actually ask these questions and sort of see uh, much more to it. And it's just really cool to just dig into this. It's like Stonehenge is nothing compared to all of this. So uh, I'm excited to tear through as much as I can and really dig into the details. I will send just now in the chat, um, I'll send the name of one scholar in particular um, that I think uh, everyone could look up. He He's usually one of the people who I would say from an archeological perspective, archeologists sometimes think he's willing to go a little too far. Like he sees, he sees alignments everywhere. And sometimes we're like, you know, there's sometimes just chance, but his work is, he's a beautiful writer and his work is really interesting. So I'll send you all his name and that's, he's a good place to start. And then you can sort of see where, where he goes with things, but he's, he's a lot of fun to follow. There you go. His name is William Romaine, William F. Romaine. Um, but he's got a lot, and, and I think his stuff will sound for There's an, he I know he has an article called Adina Hopa Earthworks and the Milky Way and the Path of Souls. You know, things that I've talked about. Um, I, I kind of took the most well accepted of some of his ideas and built them in, um, but he's got some fun stuff. This sort of opens up this whole new world of astronomy, or a, another side to astronomy, where like, I mean, my background is genetics and developmental bio, so I'm interested in like the archaeological digs where you're looking at different types of corn and things like that in the field, um, and on these mound structures. So uh, that's something really interesting that uh, I haven't really considered. We archaeologists like to steal everybody else's science and just use it a little bit. So um, we're all like a little bit geologist, a little bit astronomer, a little bit chemist. And I never would have thought to put them together. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have a speaker some years ago, a guy who was in the Allentown Club, uh, Gary Becker, who did a talk on Chaco and some of the Western sites. Oh, that's great. I, you know, I know the East much, much better, but I went to Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde a couple of years ago and it was the coolest trip I've ever taken. So I, you know, the sites out there are really, really, really amazing. I, I was through Southern Ohio the end of January. I wish I would have known about it. I, I was probably close to Newark. I actually remember driving past the city. I would have loved to See yeah, that. well, if you ever do it again. So one thing that I would be, if people want to email me, one thing I'd be happy to pass on is I have a, a very unofficial me made Google map of publicly visible mountain sites. Um, it's not specific to archaeoastronomy, but, um, but it would be easy to navigate and I can send it just as like a Google Earth file. Um, yeah. And that way, if you're ever driving anywhere, you can sort of plug in your road trip route and see if there's anything you're going to pass along the way. That would be awesome. Thank you. Um, I have students working on it. We're, we're constantly updating it, but I'm always happy to send it out in its draft form. And someday I'm hoping to get it uploaded to a website somewhere. Um, but I want to make sure all the information is really accurate first. So. Really Megan, awesome. have you seen any anything on genetics um, related to those population groups? The reason I bring it up, either National Geographic or Scientific American published something very recently, in the last couple of days, that sort of took the the, the Thor Heyerdahl um, going across the Pacific Ocean, and they found a genetic comparison between Polynesians and South American Native Americans. Um, I'm not sure yeah. about the dating. I'm but not sure. Very I, I also saw that, but I don't remember the details. Yeah, and it may not go back far enough. It may only go back to 1000 BC or, mm -hmm. or something like that. But I just so want there to, is definitely there... genetic work being done about those migrations, and um, the genetic and the linguistic data are actually the most. They're the, they, we get the most support for multiple migrations from that. So when you look at the gene pool of Native North American people, 
um, the geneticists can sort of track it back, particularly, I believe it's the um, mutations on the mitochondrial mm -hmm. DNA. Um, yep. And it allows them to, to say like this population, this population did not come in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know the genetics particularly well, but it's absolutely the case that the genetics provide some support for the idea that people did not just come over here once and then never do it again, that there were multiple migrations from Asia into the Americas. What we don't have a great sense of yet is how many people came across in those different migrations. So is it like one massive one and then some small ones that follow it? Or is it a bunch, you know, say three big ones? And we, I don't think we know that yet, but there's definitely people doing that work. But, and it's interesting, you said something about linguistics, I believe, and they found also common between the Polynesians and the the people in South America, they had several words that were extremely close. Interesting, that yeah. That linguistically, people have been wondering for decades whether possibly they were related, but now they have the DNA information to tie them more closely. Yeah, that's fa I, I wouldn't be surprised if that work is being done by some of the same people that are doing the work of looking at the migrations into the Americas, because that combination of linguistic and genetic data is, is a really strong one and a really interesting mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Um, just a quick note, I, I sent the Mound Sites um, KML file in the chat, and I think you should be able to download it from there. Still feel free to email me if you want it later, um, but it looked like it was a small enough file to send that way, so I just went ahead and put it in there. Are you Already able downloaded. to download it? Yep. Great. I haven't opened it because I'm afraid it'll crash Zoom. Uh, I can <laughs> yeah, get my video to work. <laughs> It'll, it, it opens automatically in Google Earth. So if you don't have that, you might have to download Google Earth in order to get it, but. Cool. Going back to the comments, has anyone seen the uh, Neowise comet in the morning? No. All right, there's this giant chunk of ice swinging by the sun. Uh, it's, I think it's coming back towards us now. And uh, yes. so Neowise 2020, I was looking at the wrong data. I was looking at Neowise 20. 14 and it's up in the Big Dipper right now. Um, it's not visible. I couldn't find it. I was trying. But apparently Neowise 2020 is swinging by Morning Sky near Capella right now. Um, and it's putting and in on the a northeast, show. Isn't it? Yeah, I don't have a good view to the northeast from my house. So. Well, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll have a good view at all because of tropical storm such and such. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me know if you get have an opportunity to, to observe, because I was really hoping for it. I was looking in the morning sky, uh, yes, this morning and then uh, the night before as well. So more on that as it swings by. We'll see if it breaks up just like Atlas, Atlas 1 did. <laughs> but yeah, they, they must have seen so many comets back then. Uh, and must have seen them much more clearly. And so I'm sort of shocked to, to know, like, well, these comets are depicted on the walls, whether it's a comet or supernova, supernova I don't know. But uh, it's enough to carve it into stone. Yeah, definitely. Well, and it, it probably depended on, like, which ones were, you know, was there one that was particularly bright or near a particularly important constellation that told them to interpret it in a particular way or something like that, you know? and that's harder to know. During a drought or right. uh, at spe some specific time of some occasion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going to be signing off now, not because I want to leave, because the room I'm sitting in is terribly hot. <laughs> Good room. I don't have air conditioning in this room, so um, it was very interesting. Thank well, you. Thank you for signing in. See you, Linda. Yeah, glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think um, we'll go ahead and wrap things. If we have any questions, um, Meg, you had your uh, email in this chat um, yeah i'll just i'll put it in here again that so it's down at the bottom um but feel free to shoot me an email i'm happy to pass on resources or answer any questions that you might have awesome thank you so much for doing this this is wonderful uh unfortunately we we couldn't do this in the university setting but uh, i think through zoom it worked out pretty well yeah um, definitely and hopefully i'll make it out there someday soon 
Yeah, and I'm so excited to see all the other uh, digs and stuff you're doing. I don't know if there's like a YouTube video of these sites explaining these types of things, but I'm totally going to hunt down uh, that for all of these just because they look so cool. So thanks for sharing and sort of bringing it to, to light. Yeah, of course. If you, um, the best place probably, if you want to follow along with the sites, I'll just do self-promotion here. We do have a Facebook page for the project. Um, and we also have an Instagram account that's a little harder to send. Um, but if you, if you follow along with that, that's, I'll often post, if we do do any like videos or audio files or anything like that, they usually get posted there. So that's one of the best ways to sort of keep up to date on what we're up to. Um, but otherwise, if you just uh, search Smith Creek Archaeological Project online, you'll see stuff that we post through the Penn Museum a lot. Um, so I, you know, my content gets posted on their website a lot too. So you could also follow the Penn Museum on various social media and you'll probably hear more than you want to about Northeast or Southeastern archaeology. Awesome. What was it, Smith Creek? Smith Creek Archaeological Project. We call it SCAP. So if you click that Facebook link too, it'll, it, that's the title of the page. So in case you forget. Yeah, I wrote down the numbers, uh, but I will be sure to click it just so I don't crash soon. <laughs> Typed it underneath for you too. So, awesome. um, and that's a good, I, I run that too. So that's always a good way to get in touch with me too. So any, any message that gets sent there will also come to me. Social media, that's more my speed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. You can do that. Good luck in your future endeavors finding things. Thank you very much. It was really nice to talk to you all and feel free to get in touch. Appreciate Thanks it. for joining us. All right. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for doing this. Take good Bye -bye. care. Bye.